we'll be recording these and then um, uploading them to the website. So if there's ever a reason why you can't make it at the time that we're doing it live, you can experience the tastings with the experts. Um, pretty much get the entire experience. Only thing is that you can't ask questions, which tends to be a lot of fun too. But um, I mean, the wine is the best part, right? Um, so just real briefly, I'd like to introduce Tracy. Um, Tracy will tell you a little bit about herself, but um, I had the pleasure of being introduced to her um, through another friend of mine um, who is also a distributor. Tracy ha has many years in the, in the industry, lots of experience. Her husband is an amazing chef. Um, and as many of you heard, she's got a beautiful little chunk of monka baby that's turning one um, this coming week. Um, so we have lots to celebrate there. Um, and she's just such a sweet little girl. Um, but uh, tonight we're tasting through one of the most amazing um, wines, wineries I've ever experienced in my life. And Tracy actually introduced me. I, I hadn't even, I'd heard of Raj. Um, but I wasn't familiar with Sandy and she, knowing that I'm from Santa Barbara, um, brought me in all these amazing central coast wines. And, um, when I tasted this Pinot and the Chardonnay, I died. Like, it's just, I don't like Pinots normally. They don't have enough character for me. There's, there's not enough substance to them for me personally. Um, I like bigger reds, but when you try the Sande, you're gonna realize how absolutely amazingly special this, this is. Um, the Rosé of Pinot, um, we were only able to get a case actually of any of these, except for the Chardonnay, we were able to get a little bit more, but um, very highly allocated, very respected award-winning winemaker. Um, I'm gonna keep going on and on and stepping on Tracy's toes if I just <laughs> keep talking. Um, but I, I'm just so excited to share this with you. We're going to do this, like I said, every Friday. Um, so hopefully this isn't going to be the only one that you guys can join us for. I really think these are going to be a really special night for everybody. Um, so without further ado, Tracy Willis with Natural Wine Company. Hi, guys. Um, all right. So we are going to enjoy some Sandy wines tonight. So everybody raise a glass because let's get started with our drinks, right? Yay, cheers. Hopefully everybody's starting. We well, can do whatever you want, but I'll start myself with uh, talking about the Chardonnay and stuff. Um, so first off, um, kind of just a little background of oops, who I am, who this who this lady is talking to you in her, her dark office. Um, but uh, I work for a natural wine company. Um, so we're a distributor here in Colorado, we're a, what they call a small portfolio or a small book here in Colorado. Um, we're not one of these big, um, big brands that work with like Maker's Mark and Jack Daniels and all of that sort of thing. Um, we are locally one business here in, uh, in Denver. And uh, we started in 2009. Um, everyone thought my boss was insane for starting in a recession. Um, but uh, now we're going through a pandemic and still hanging in there. So I think he's doing something right. And uh, we definitely have some great wines in our book. So first off, everything in my book, everything that, uh, that ends up in Jen's hands uh, is either natural, biodynamic, or organic uh, as for wine goes. So just give me a raise of hands. Who's familiar with most of those terms? I don't want to dumb anything down or not let you guys know enough stuff. What do you guys know about bio, biodynamic? Do you guys know anything about biodynamic wines? A little Tell bit, me. somewhat. Okay. So um, you really can just kind of encompass all all wines uh, that we have in our book. First off and foremost is natural. All natural means is that it is using the naturally occurring yeasts that are native and indigenous to the land. So um, it was kind of popular back in like the, the especially in, Cal in California in the 90s to bring in yeasts from Burgundy and Bordeaux, trying to make your wine taste like it's from elsewhere. Um, really with natural wine, you're just saying, hey, I'm using what is naturally occurring here. Whatever, you know, is happening in my land and in my soil, it's going to end up in the wine. I'm not going to try to make it be something that it's not. So that's number one, what a natural wine is. Um, and number two is just just low manipulations. We're, we're letting the wine be itself. 
or letting it do its own thing um, and just kind of letting it be its own, its own self, letting it shine, letting the wine talk. We're not adding a bunch of flavorants, preservatives, chemicals. Um, unfortunately, most brand name wine, um, I don't want to call out too many bad brand names uh, to like, not trying to shame anyone for what they drink, um, but the bigger, we'll say Yellowtail, right? We can all say Yellowtail is the, the big brand, right? They put in so many chemicals, preservatives, additives, flavorants, colorants, I mean, everything on earth to make that wine taste exactly the same from bottle to bottle in the millions of bottles that they're pumping out, right? Um, because if you want to break it down, it's just grape juice, right? So if you're going to your local farmer's market, you don't expect all the tomatoes to look the same, taste the same every year, year in, year out. So why would we expect all of our grapes to do that, right? So it's kind of like this McDonaldization of, uh, of wine, these big brands. Um, and so that's why you can always expect Mayomi to taste exactly the same. And you can always expect, you know what I'm saying? So, so needless to say, my wine is the antithesis of that. Everything in your glass varies from vintage to vintage, um, all, all depending upon, you know, who's making the wine and um, the climate and what happened that year. Um, let me just say, first and foremost, 2020 is going to be a crazy vintage uh, for so many reasons. So keep your eyes peeled. There's going to be some stellar 2020s. There's going to be some really bad 2020s as well, especially with all the fires that happened in California and Oregon and Washington. Uh, you're going to see a lot of rosé, lots of rosé coming in 2020 uh, because uh, less skin contact with the grape, which was exposed to smoke. Um, the better the juice is going to be, the more skin contact, you can get that smoke taint is what they call that. So it's going to make your wine taste smoky. So the reds might not be so great in 2020. Getting off track because that's what I do. I apologize. Um, with, uh, <laughs> so just kind of to give you a little, a little background on that. But uh, so everything that you're drinking tonight um, is made by two killer winemakers, uh, Rajat Parr and Sashi Mormon. And uh, they make biodynamic wine. So biodynamic wine is really, we're taking organic to the next level, right? So you can have organic vines. So you can say, yep, I don't use any herbicides or pesticides. Everything that I do on my vineyard is organic. But if you say your vine is organic, you can still manipulate stuff and do things in your cellar. You can still use, you know, additives and preservatives and colorants in your cellar, therefore making the wine more stable, uh, you know, but uh, not necessarily as pure as you want to. Um, it's also it's also kind of just working with the earth. And uh, it's like saying we have bees on our property because the bees pollinate the flowers of the grapes. We have bats on our property. The bats eat the bugs instead of using, uh, you know, using any kind of chemical pesticide. Um, we have cows or not cows, they're bad, but like sheep and goats and things like that, um, that are naturally using the manure. And that's what we're using for our fertilizer. So it's just, it's like an all encompassing kind of uh, a way of thinking about farming, uh, not just grapes, but it's, it's, it's kind of doing everything like that. So um, Rajat Par is a very big proponent of biodynamic wine. And there's very many levels of biodynamic wine. Um, you can see biodynamics being really weird, funky, cloudy, uh, non-filtered wine, but you can have really beautiful, clean, pure wines um, that are the wines of Sandy coming from biodynamics as well. So first and foremost, we are hanging out in the Central California Appalachian tonight. Um, so we're talking about a pretty broad swath of territory from, uh, you know, San Francisco down to Santa Barbara. We're really focusing and honing in on the Santa Rita Hills Appalachian tonight. Um, that's where we're going to uh, see most of our wine coming out of here. And what's kind of a, a good key indicator of Santa Rita Hills is that um, they have Cool, they have more of a cooler weather climate because they're a little bit higher up in elevation. They have these fantastic maritime winds coming out from the ocean. They have these wonderful cold fogs that kind of blow in and keep the temperatures cool. So some of the coolest 
climate sites in all of California or in the Santa Rita Hills Appalachian. So this means perfection for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. These are very temperamental grapes, especially Pinot is a very thin skinned, um, easily uh, destroyed grape. Uh, that's why it's always more expensive than the, than the cabs and stuff. Cabs like a hardy grape that you can't really destroy. Pinots are sensitive um, and easy to, and easy to, to uh, mess up, I guess. Um, Sorry, but, I don't uh, mean to interrupt. I just want to also yeah. add just uh, literally bordering Santa Rita Hills feet away um, because there is that um, th there's all these valleys um, that the the Santa Rita there's specific winds that that, that come through there um, that hit this channel but literally a few feet away it could be 117 or 120 degrees where you can have a vineyard that has a you know has only Bordeaux, thick skin grapes, and then right next to it. That's why Santa Rita Hills is so perfect because it's kind of an anomaly in this little tiny AVA um, that makes the most beautiful Chardonnay and Pinots that you just can't reproduce, you know, from vineyard to vineyard. It just depends on how that wind, Santa Ana winds come in and and dissipate that that heat because. Pinot is a very finicky grape, like you said, <laughs> very sensitive. Yeah, Sorry, sensitive. really quick, um, I wanted to let you guys know, and I meant to say this before, and then Tracy, I'm gonna shut the hell up. Um, if you guys scroll over, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Zoom. I'm not a Zoomer or a Zoomy or whatever, but you can do a chat down at the bottom and you can ask Tracy any questions. If you don't wanna unmute yourself and interrupt like I am so rudely doing right now to her, um, you can um, add a chat. Uh, and, and ask her any questions that you have in the moment. And now I'm shutting up. Bye. <laughs> You're fine. I feel like because I'm not getting any feedback from you guys, obviously, I feel like I'm just droning on and on. I hope it's not completely boring and I'm sorry <laughs> if it is. I'm a total wine geek, so uh, I can go on and on about things. But uh, um, but anyways, so um, we're in Santa Rita, as she was saying, that's a perfect, perfect segue into what I was talking about, into why your wine is going to taste different than uh, your typical, we'll say, buttery, oaky, uh, you know, California shard. Not number one, it's different because it's made well. Uh, it's not full of chemicals and preservatives and all that stuff I mentioned before. Um, but number two, you get a leaner style wine when you have a cooler climate. Cold means like you know, less heat, less heat means less intensity. So you're going to have a leaner, more stone fruit, um, you know, higher acid. The wines of Santa Rita Hills are known for their high acidity uh, because they are more lean in style. You're not going to have these like heavy weighted kind of fatty wines that can happen in Paso. Paso gets hot, you know, you get a, a Paso Zen and you've got this beast in your face of wine uh, because temperature uh, equates to higher alcohol volume uh, equates to these big, big, bold wines. And so currently speaking, there are, um, there's a kind of a, a, a new movement coming out of California, kind of these avant-garde uh, natural winemakers that grew up in the vines. A lot of them were the sons and daughters of people that worked at, you know, Kendall Jackson and people that, you know, worked at Ravenswood. And uh, they saw how their parents were making wine and they, they fell in love with winemaking, but they said, you know what? I'm not going to continue to do this commercial, you know, farming. I'm going to do my own thing, make it boutique, small, small batches, all of that sort of thing. And, uh, in just no manipulation and just let the wine speak for itself. Um, so that's exactly what, uh, Sandy has done. So Sandy is, uh, uh it means, collaboration in Sanskrit, actually. Um, and it's two gentlemen, um, Rajat Par and Sashi Mormon are the winemakers here. And so where you have Rajat Par, who's kind of this, he is this famous sommelier. If you've seen any of the Psalm movies on Netflix, he's in every single one of them. Um, he's from Calcutta. Uh, he studied in, uh, he studied in London before moving to California 
joined the um, Mina restaurant group, became this incredible award-winning sommelier and decided to uh, branch out and start making wine. He teamed up with Sashi Mormon. Now Sashi is the farmer guy, right? He's, he's from the Santa Barbara area. Um, they actually live in, um, I don't know, is it, I can't, is it Lompoc, Jen? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Long po. Long po. Okay. That's where he lives right now. But it, okay. I say Buena Vista, so, you know. <laughs> That's okay. I'm yeah. like, I'm going to say Long Pack and sound like an idiot. Long po <laughs> is where he currently lives. Um, and so he's the everyday, day in, day out kind of guy that's maintaining the vines. Him and his wife actually um, also own a winery called Peter Rossi. It's a winery and bakery where they mill their own flour. So really, really a local guy. Um, and uh, Rajat is the jet setter and he goes around and he's been on so many different podcasts. I'll drink to that's a big podcast that he's on all the time. Uh, the color of wine. If any of you geek out on these wine podcasts like I do, um, he's he's all over that. So Raj, Raj is known for his, um, he's a super taster. Um, the man can drink any wine, any vintage, tell you exactly what it is, the producer, all of the above. Um, even more than like most master sommeliers, um, he, he's an incredible taster. Um, and so his, his wines really show for that. So Going into um, the Chardonnay that you're having tonight, this is a Central Coast Chardonnay. So the re they had a Santa Rita, um, uh, excuse me, a Santa Barbara Appalachian all before prior to 2018 vintage, um, and they decided to not do it in this vintage because the uh, where they were sourcing their grapes from, they started spraying pesticides on the neck the the um, vineyard next door. So they were like nope, not doing that. We would never, ever, ever put a wine out that had any kind of pesticide or herbicide near it. Um, and so they've now done uh, the Central Coast Appalachian. So they do own some um, vineyard plots and vineyard sites, um, but to get this wine in your glass at an affordable price, because uh, the stuff they own is is uh, is in the Domaine de la Cote vineyard site. Um, they're sourcing from Santa Inez, Santa Clarita, and Santa Barbara. We're all still just north of Santa Barbara, all in that Santa Rita Hills Appalachian area. So nothing too far out of the ordinary. Um, but uh, they do um, age for 10 months in neutral oak. And that's the big key proponent of what's in your glass. You can taste a tiny little bit of cream, a tiny little bit of that Chardonnay backbone, but it really is all about the, the lean Santa Rita Chardonnay. Um, and using the neutral oak, we're not imparting all those like tannin vanilla flavors um, on, on that. So um, yes, I am now just looking at the Zoom chat. So let me look at this. <laughs> I've been answering too though. So don't, don't, okay, good. don't get overwhelmed with that. But I, I do want to let everyone know because um, Tracy's amazing and lets me taste a ton of different wine. And I'm gonna answer everybody. And Melissa, really quick, cause it'll be faster. The hard cheese is Gouda. It's an 18 month Gouda Beamster um, from Amsterdam. Um, and it is so good. You're absolutely right. They're all really good. The um, other cheese is local. It's jumping good out of Buena Vista. Cause that's how you pronounce it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My family's from there and they would kill me if I said that. So I just I know, usually call right. it BV. <laughs> just call it BV and you make everybody happy. <laughs> no, no, because it's Buena Vista. <laughs> Ask anyone who speaks Spanish. Um, so I wanted to ask you really quick um, or point out the fact. So you bring me a lot of different wines. And when it came to Sandy, you actually brought me a couple of Chardonnays. You brought me a couple of the Pinots. Um, you actually brought me the Santa Rita Hills um, that was from their vineyard and hands down. I mean, I, I might be one of the only people that you deal with that went in this direction, but I was like, I actually for like throw the price point out the door. Um, I actually preferred the more affordable one that was Central Coast. And I loved the story behind it that they, didn't want to, um, that they decided to change after all of these years, what was it, two decades that they were buying from them? And they decided because their neighbors were spraying that they weren't gonna do it. But the other Chardonnay, the Santa Rita Hills Chardonnay um, was twice the price right? At least easy, right? I think it was twice the price. Yeah, Santa Rita's like, 
yeah it would it would be definitely to to your people at least 10 to 15 bucks more if not more yeah exactly um, yeah very lean so very tart <laughs> yeah it didn't have the stone fruit quality that this yes. one has um i so it, and this actually, I made a post on there as a joke, but like, this is a Chardonnay that even the biggest Chardonnay haters cannot say that they hate this. Like, it's such a good Chardonnay. It's just so well balanced, great acid, has that beautiful stone fruit, almost like, um, I don't want to say plummy, but like an unripened plum, you know, where it's like, you can still get a little bit of tannic qualities in the skins from that you get in a plum. Um, without that fake buttery taste to it. So um, yeah, I hope you guys like it. It sounds like you guys are liking it. Everybody thumbs up, we all like, or middle, thumbs up, down. I think okay. everybody's like, cool. Awesome, yeah, so um, the vines here are only 25 years old too, which I mean, I guess in all, I work with a lot of old world wine and so that's a very young vine for uh for old world's sake um but in california 25 years old is is pretty yeah we're middle-aged there i would say uh <laughs> but uh yeah just delicious juice and i'm so glad that they actually did that this year because in them getting sourcing wine from three different sites they made more um and so there's still more available so this is available jen has this um, she can get more of this from me. So if this turns into your, your fave shard, uh, you can get it from Jen. It's, it's tasty stuff. Um, so it's, going it's fairly affordable and it's the only of the Sandy that I actually still have available for sale. You guys bought me out tonight. So congrats and thank you. <laughs> so you will only see me drinking Chardonnay because there is no more Rosé. There is no more Pinot. Um, so therefore I cannot have those. So party on guys. No uh, you guys have the last of it. Same problem. <laughs> and you own the wine and I own the wine and neither of us <laughs> can drink the wine. No. <laughs> yeah, I actually um, had pulled a sample bottle of the Pinot two days ago and my boss called me and he was like, about that, um, you can't have that. And I was like, why not? And he's like, we just tried to buy more from the vineyard, they're out. So you can't, you can't have that wine. I was I like- I tried to. No! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was sad, but uh, Raj is really close with us. We've represented uh, Sandy since they started. Um, and so uh, he's like, I think I got a little bit of the 17 uh, Pinot in the back. So we are going to be getting in some of the 17 vintage, um, which is kind of cool because um, it is awesome as well. It got 93 points on Venice as well. Um, so that will be coming. So if you guys are really interested, you, if you're loving the 18 um, and you're wanting to get that, uh, talk with Jen. And then if you, there's enough interest, she'll get some of that from me in, in a couple weeks. It, it should be here in a couple weeks. So on the forefront yeah, of that. Yeah, about that. I would like some, please. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. So then going into the rosé, this vintage is the first vintage that I don't know if it's the first vintage they've made, but it's the first vintage that they have, that's made it to Colorado. I'll say that. Um, so it is Pinot Noir. So obviously with Rosé, we just have a tiny bit of skin contact um, with a red wine grape, thus imparting the pink hue onto the grape. Um, they actually uh, got this from the Rinconada Vineyard, as well as a little bit from the San Luis Obispo area. Um, and what's really amazing from this rosé. So most rosés, especially any affordable rosé that's in your glass normally, does not see any oak. And there is many reasons for that. Oak aging takes time. Oak imparts flavor onto the wine. Um, all these things are generally things that are not beneficial, uh, I guess you would say, in a rosé. Unfortunately, people still have this idea that there's a rosé season. I drink rosé year-round. I love it all the time. It's the best thing to drink with any meal, if you ask me, um, especially this time of year when we're dealing lots of poultry, um, lots of cheeses and fatty things. Rosé is perfect because white, you know, it can kind of, you need something a little bit bolder when it's cold out, but sometimes red, like you don't want a red wine if you're having something spicy. And I just, I just love rosé for fall and for winter. I think it's just perfect, especially uh, a Pinot Noir rosé. So um, this sees oak. Oh. Nice. <laughs> Bedtime for when you first wake up. Whenever, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, this is actually aged, it's fermented and aged in oak 
for five months. Um, and I don't know if you guys can uh, taste any of the oak imparting on the wine, but it, it should be unbelievably subtle if you can. Um, but this is a stellar, beautiful, elegant rosé. Um, I actually hadn't tasted this until I brought Jen, because it, when it first came, COVID has done some crazy stuff to our, uh, to the wine. It's, it's been good in a lot of respects because with restaurants not buying as much, all these wines that we thought were allocated and we only, we're going to get two cases to the state. Then we've, especially in, in, um, California and Oregon and things like that, we've had the winemakers call us and they're like, Hey, you know how I said you could only have like 10 cases? Well, the restaurants aren't buying my stuff. So do you guys want more? Um, and so we were able to get more. I was able to get more uh, and get it into Jen's hands uh, early fall. And I tasted it with her for the first time. And I was like, oh my gosh, I know, this we is a, a delicious rosé. We I both did so... a happy dance. That was a really yes. good tasting. It's so good. It's so mad at myself. Um, I didn't buy I'm very anything. jealous of you guys. Just right so now, you know, this is probably not going to get it next year. So enjoy it. And, and <laughs> damn it, I gave you the last bottle. Should have poured myself a glass. <laughs> but yes, uh, what do you guys think? I was just going to ask the same thing. Everyone liking it? Everyone's liking it. So, so on Josh. All right. Okay. We like it. All right. Hey, Josh, what is it that you are so, so about? Will you tell me? Just question. I just love to know what people think. I'm not really a fan of uh, this type of wine. <laughs> Rosés in general. He's never. Rosés in general. Okay. All right. I get you. I always just want to know if people are like it's too tart or too something. I just always want to know what people like in wine because I'm a wise wine salesperson. So I kind of like to know. No, what so challenge drink accepted. And like. Josh, we will get you. So so Josh just uh, came in tonight for the first time, um, and I vowed that we will get him. Okay, so this is his first tasting, I think, one of his first tastings, if not his first tasting, and he's starting off pretty bougie. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Very much so. Bob, um, but we'll we'll find a rosé that you'll like. I always accept those challenges, and I haven't failed yet. So, Tracy and I will find one for you. <laughs> I like it. If we have to taste through every rosé once this COVID crap is up. <laughs> huh. Yeah, and like I said, um, a little back note. I've heard from a lot of my California. Uh, Oregon producers and such that um, they are putting pretty much 95% of their red wine into rosé this year. So if you are a rosé fan, if you like rosé in the slightest, be on the lookout. There is going to be some incredible juice in 2020. Um, I work with a, a producer called Birakino. Um, they're also out of the kind of like the um uh santa santa oh there's too many santas kind of the santa inez area um and santa cruz mountain range and all of their wine that they generally sell for like 30 40 50 upwards in their reds their grenaches muvedra all these things they're all going into their their uh rosé that's going to be probably 15 16 bucks retail um so it's, an, it's going to be an incredible way to get affordable juice um and juice that's going to last it's not going to be anything like unfortunately rosé has kind of gotten this bad rap of like oh well they have this extra you know they bought they had too many red grapes so they just put a bunch of it into rosé and they made it cheap and whatever um and it's definitely not that it's 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 a fun pet project for all winemakers when they do make a rosé. They're not doing it because it's trendy, honestly. Um, they're doing it because it's 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 kind of a labor of love to do a rosé and uh, set some aside for that. So, so sorry, uh, Eric. I think it was Erica that you you had asked a question. Yeah. So this is basically because of all the fires. Yeah. Yeah. So um, because the fire season was so enamored and so close to harvest time. Um, those grapes had matured and they were on the vine when all these fires hit. And so the skin of the grape is what collects the smoke. 
And so when you're making red wine, right, red wine, you're pressing and crushing and leaving those, those skins on. So the longer the skin is on the grape, the longer the time it has that it can impart all that smoky flavor um, into the wine. So white wine, you're probably safe, um, but red wine is really going to get hit bad with that. Um, and unfortunately the fires were really bad in this, in this area, in this region. We are so fortunate. All of the winemakers that we represent, um, were spared. Um, but, uh, we've had a lot of friends that weren't so lucky. Um, and so it's, it's a really tough, not only was it tough because of that, but they didn't have anybody to work for them this year because of COVID. There is nobody around to pick grapes during harvest time when people are quarantining and can't do these things. So the winemakers themselves that traditionally aren't out there picking the grapes were out there picking the grapes. They were working close to, to 18, 19 hours um, during harvest time, which is as the, the favorite word that I kind of get annoyed because people use it too much right now is it's unprecedented, uh, the amount that the winemakers uh, have really been involved in the harvest this year, most of them. Um, so uh, I just have a very soft spot in my heart for all those guys that have been laboring out there and dealing with all this, so. It'll be interesting to see how the price point pans out too. Like, does it yeah. go higher because they have less yield? Yeah, oh, and a really Back interesting, to be yeah. to like cash in on the um, insurance. So there's actually going to be even less available because they, if they harvested, they would have lost this. They could have only harvested like five or 10% were salvageable. Yeah. And that would have made them ineligible for their insurance. So it's going to be interesting to see who chose to take the insurance versus and, and not harvest. I mean, that's literally where they just left them for the birds. Yeah. Um, quick question for you, Tracy. So Adrian wants to know, said that, it, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've only ever had this once. Um, sorry, nope, lie, twice. I had it once when I tasted with you and then I opened a bottle the second that the case was delivered to me. Um, so Adrian said it has a funky odor that we like, ha that we like. How do you describe the odor? Um, okay, so with most natural wine, it's kind of confusing, right? I don't know if any of you guys have had some super funky natural wine and you stick your nose in the glass and it smells like a cow fart. And everyone's it. like, everyone's like, um, why? <laughs> everyone's like, why does it smell? And it's, it's poopy. Why does it smell poopy? Um, and so they're like, if you're not using sulfur and if you're not using, you know, all of these things, why does it stink versus wines that when you are using that don't? So you just have to think about it. If you strip a wine down, if you're not adding in these preservatives and flavorants and colorants and additives and all these things, if it's just the wine and the only thing that you're doing for any kind of stabilization and any kind of pesticide control is spraying a tiny bit of sulfur on your grapes to keep the bugs away and to stabilize the wine, that's the only thing that you're going to smell in the wine besides the natural occurring smells that you get from wine, right? So if you're not diluting that, if you're not putting all these other things in there to make it sterile, if you will, um, that's all you're going to smell. And so that happens a lot in natural wines. Um, we, uh, you know, we call it RA uh, and we say, let it blow off. Um, so if you do get a natural wine and it smells poopy, just give it a minute, get it some air, swish it around a lot in your glass, that will blow off. Um, it's just the naturally occurring sulfur. Um, and just some geeky factoids here. Um, there in the, in the United States, it's legal to add 200 to 300 parts per million of sulfur dioxide to your wine after it is made to stabilize it and to, you know, make it all taste the same. Natural wine, uh, has less than 20. So you're working with, if anyone ever says to you, oh, I can't drink wine. It gives me a headache. I'm allergic to sulfites, anything like that. That is potentially possible. More than likely they're having a reaction to the other things that are chalked into that wine to the camera, you know, the chemicals, because there is more, you know, if you can eat a handful of grapes and not get a headache, 
then you can drink a glass of natural wine. And it, it, I hope that makes sense. Like there's no more than would be in grapes itself or that any other thing that there's naturally occurring sulfite. So um, if you have any friends, family members, anybody that's interested in wine, but they think it gives them a headache, try to get them to drink natural wine because it's not going to do that to them. You're not going to have that nasty hangover the next day because you're drinking a lot more sugar uh, all those big brand names chalk their wines full of sugar. They're so sweet um, because sugar really kind of um, masks over impurities and imperfections. That's another thing with natural wine is sometimes the vintages, sometimes you'll have vintage, you're like, eh, it's not my favorite. There's nothing to mask that wine, right? There's nothing to hide its imperfection and impurity. Um, so you're just left with what you got that year. And so sometimes some vintages aren't the best. Um, and so it is kind of putting all of your eggs in one basket. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, especially Italian winemakers, um, especially in France, um, in Sancerre in particular, Americans kind of are always late to the to the train, but I'm sure you guys know if you're in, in, anybody's into wine, Sancerre is very popular here right now. Um, it really got popular last year and we kind of came into the popular game of Sancerre at a horrible time because 2016 and 2017, uh, the, the Appalachian of Sancerre had a huge early frost and also late season hailstorms, and most of them lost 80% of their crop. And so that's why Sancerre is so stinking expensive because they're just, there's not enough wine to make. I, there are so many winemakers in my book that were just like, we didn't make wine this year. That's just the way it worked for us. What's that? Not because of 50 shades of gray. That's what I mean. Like Americans came into it because of something like that, right? And then it just so happened that they had a couple of awful climate. In terms of Sancerre. I mean, besides it being just the region, but you know, it's kind of like, like explaining what Burgundy is. Burgundy, like if you if you have a Burgundian white, it's Chardonnay. If you have a Burgundian red, it's Pinot. And the Sancerre is Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> Sancerre is a tiny appellation inside of the Loire Valley, inside of France. So if you want to put it into California's perspective, it's like Powell Mountain inside of Napa Valley, inside of California. So that's how tiny, tiny, tiny the appellation is. Another reason why it's really expensive. Um, but anyways, kind of obviously getting off topic. Um, Aaron says, how do you know if you're getting a natural wine? That's a great question, Aaron. Um, so the first thing to do there, you know, you can, some, some wines will say organic grapes, organic on the label. Those are easy indicators. Um, I really suggest if you, if you're going to any wine shop, any restaurant, um, ask your person, that's what they're there for. Ask the shop manager, person on the floor, just say, Hey, I'm looking for natural wine. I'm looking for organic wine. Can you point me in that direction? If you don't want to ask that question, you're very safe in going with A, like I've said a hundred times already tonight, don't buy a brand name wine. I'm sorry, but most brand name wines are not natural. Um, they can't be, they make too much of it. Um, but B, old world wines for the most part and not, and I, I'm, I'm excluding things like Santa Margarita, Pinot Grigio, right? Like that's an Italian Pinot Grigio, but it's a brand name, right? For the most part, old world wines do not do that. They kind of look at Americans like, why are you, why are you messing with wine? Like people in France and Spain and Italy, they've been making wine for thousands of years and they, they still make it today the way they've made it all of those years ago. And so they're not manipulating. They're not adding all of these things. They're aging in barrel. Um, like for instance, um, in California, you know, you get these toasty, buttery, oaky shards. Yeah. People think that a, that means that it was aged in oak. That doesn't necessarily mean it was aged in oak. That means that somebody dumped a bag of wood into the wine and they stirred it up for a few minutes, getting all that, that oaky flavor imparted in the wine and then they just stick it in the bottle. So it's I making the- Don't about the oak on a rope. It's yes. Like what do they do on the bung, but they attach to the bung and then they just- let it sit in there. It's disgusting. Yeah. So that, and it's, and it's all about, you know, profit. Same every year. Yeah. Because naming names. Yes. AJ. If it tastes the same, if you don't yeah. notice that they've changed the vintage on the shelf, 
Yeah. Because it tastes the same every year, then you know it's not natural. Yeah. That's when you have a hangover. I'm going to tell you right now, <laughs> most of my wines are natural. All of Tracy's wines are natural. A lot of my list is natural. I have a lot less hangovers since I've had Tracy in my life. <laughs> a lot less hangovers. And I drank a lot of wine. <laughs> Yeah. And it's, you know, and it, it's, but it was funny because when I started working with natural wine company, um, I actually came into, uh, came into working for natural. I was a server at a restaurant, um, called Barolo grill in Cherry Creek. I don't know if any of you guys have been there before heard of it. Uh, it's a stellar Italian restaurant. I was there for five and a half years. They, they close the restaurant down every summer and they take everybody to Italy, um, to learn about wine and food. So I, uh, really, uh, got my feet wet in Italy learning about wine. Um, and so I was kind of scared when I got hired with natural, cause I was like, I don't really know a lot about natural wine. Like I know a lot about Italian wine. Um, and then learning about natural wine, I was like, oh, all these people in Italy are doing natural wine. It's just how they make it. You know, it's just, they're not marketing themselves. And especially with Italians, they're like, this is just how you make it. The fruits, uh, they really shine. You don't have to put a lot of crap in your wine, you know, anyways. Uh, but they, they would never chalk it full of crap because they're Italians, right? They're like, no, why would we ever do that? So um, it's, it's just leaving the wine alone. Now, there's some definitely, and I don't know any people that are kind of bigger into wine, some terms that are becoming really big right now in the natural wine world that you may hear. And like, you might have heard of natty wine. I don't know if any of you guys have, this is kind of a geeky term that your hipster cousin might ask you about, but um, natty wine is kind of the epitome of natural, right? So Natural wine, organic wine, these are just wines being made the way they should be made, the way they've been made for hundreds of years. Natty is kind of taking it to the next step. These are using like crazy weird varietals that, you know, like you're getting Vermentino out of Oregon and Tempranillo out of Santa Barbara. And they like, they're not filtering, they're not fining, they're doing biodynamics. Um, a lot of orange wines are natty wines. Um, these are the term pet nat. That means a naturally sparkling wine that was never disgorged. Anyway, these are all geeky terms um, and they are popping up everywhere. But the cool thing about natty wine is it's, they usually have some weird funky hipster label on the bottle. They look like a sour beer and they look like an IPA and it's getting my beer drinkers interested in wine. And that's the coolest thing ever because Colorado is a beer drinking state. And I love pulling people into the wine world. Um, so if it gets them drinking it, it's awesome. But anyways, I have that, that's a different tasting. Jen's not a huge fan of Natty Wines. They're kind of weird. Um, so we won't get into that, but um, you may you may hear that term coming up a lot more in the next few years Noble here because Colorado's Riot. getting into it. Noble Riot is definitely known for that. Um, yeah, Noble Riot, that wine shop is awesome, but those guys do some funky wines. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Not my thing. I've tried it. I've tried to bring it in here. I I just, I can't. There are some fantastic, really natty wines, but they're not super affordable. They're pretty expensive for the most part. So it's hard to get people into those. Um, but anyways, if some of you guys not I jumped on board, I, have a, um, I meant to ask you this before because um, Aaron and Allison asked not to backtrack, but they asked if extra smoky equals yucky. Um, and I started to reply to them and then thought better of it because I think it would be better coming from you. I don't, I don't know that it means, I don't know that I can describe that. Yes, it, it's yucky in this particular instance, smoke in wine, the flavor isn't yucky. I've got a beautiful Tempranillo that exudes smokiness and deliciousness, but how does the smoke with the fires specifically yeah. impart? It's not necessarily on the terroir, because I think the terroir can be beautiful, but yeah. skins, I think, meh. It's, you know, and sometimes if you, if it's just the tiniest hint of smoke taint, it actually can add a fun little element to it that you don't normally get. Um, but for instance, um, one of our producers uh, that's out of Willamette Valley, when they were having those bad fires, I think it was like three or four years ago, right? During harvest time, 
Um, they brought their portfolio for us to taste and um, we stuck our nose in a glass of one of their blends and it seriously smelled like I was sticking my nose in a glass of mezcal. I mean, it was like in your face, smoke, chimney, soot. Like it was bad. You felt like you just stuck your head inside of a forest fire. Um, and then you drank the wine and it wasn't so bad. You got a little bit of a smoky edge to it, but there is so much about wine and about the enjoyment of wine that is the smell, it is the aroma. And if you can't get over that, if you can't, you don't want to plug your nose and drink the wine, that's, that's getting rid of 80% of the enjoyment of the wine. So if you can't get over that, then it really is just, it just ruins the wine. And another little geeky factoid I actually just found out this year is there is one lab in all of California um, where you can mail in your grape sample. The lab will conduct trials and experiments on this grape, and it will let you know in all scientific terms, the bricks and all of these sorts of things, how much smoke taint is on your grape. So if you were a winemaker that was like, oh my gosh, how much has been affected by this? Tell me so I know if I can make red wine or not. You had to send your grape sample in to this one single laboratory in California. So because so many vineyards this summer were affected by that, there was a month and a half waiting period. So that means you're waiting for a month and a half. That doesn't exist. You can't let your grape vine. You can't let a, a you know, you can't let your grapes just sit around for a month and a half and not do anything. They're going to rot, go moldy, go bad. Right. So instead of doing that, uh, they just had to be like, well, either they gambled and they, they made wine this year and they said, we'll see what happens. We don't think it's that bad. Or they said, shit, uh, we're just going to make rosé because we want to be able to still sell these grapes. Um, and so that's why it's all going to go into rosé is because so many, so many of them couldn't, couldn't sit around and wait for those results to come back. So hopefully that helps. Um, I think we have people that are ready to move on to the, yeah, I was like, I'm, I'm like, I'm ready for the Pinot. I bet there's some people that need to go. Uh, cause I can ramble forever. Um, well, but <laughs> trying to imply that I'm just saying that, um, Jill, who is very much like me, um, Jill and I have, uh, twinsy palettes. Um, so we both are not huge fans of Pinot and she already moved on to try it. And she's like, yeah, just like you, I, I'm not a Pinot enthusiast, but this is amazing. So I would love for you to explain about the domain. Um, yeah, Domain de la Cote. This one is like, oh, <laughs> so um, I don't have any of. <laughs> so Raj and Sashi own, um, own some vineyard sites. Uh, they're on the western side of Santa Rita Hills. There's five different plots um, and they are um, called their Domain de la Cote. Um, so they actually make, Raj and Sashi own a couple of different wineries. They own Sandy, um, they own Domaine de la Cote, and they own Evening Land, which is actually in Willamette Valley, Oregon. So Domaine de la Cote, which Jen, I don't know if Jen's ever tried, I want to speak for her, but these are ridiculous wines. These are like 98, 99 point wines. Um, they are my cost, well, I don't even want to say my cost. You would have to spend probably about $100 a bottle on these wines, and the state gets um, my, my territory, um, I was allocated, uh, like eight bottles last year that I had to spread around to my 60 different accounts, eight bottles, um, of this wine that these guys make. They make maybe a hundred cases a year, um, of their 100% Domaine Delico. All they do is Pinot Noir. Um, so with that being said, um, this Pinot that you guys are drinking, 70% of this is coming from the Domaine de la Cote vineyard. Um, so the other 20% is actually coming from Sanford and Benedict vineyard, which is the oldest vineyard site in all of the Santa Rita Hills Appalachian. Um, and so you're getting some- the most famous. The most yeah, it's the most famous. It's the oldest. It was planted in 1971. The, um, the vines, in this Pinot, our original planting, 1971. Um, so you're getting Domaine de la Cote, the creme de la creme of the wine that Roz and Chassie make, blended with Sanford and Benedict, and they make it affordable, which is incredible. Um, and they are, are aging for 14 months in neutral with this. So I, what I really enjoy about this wine is you're getting, this is 
this to me is true California wine, right? Like you wouldn't blind this and be like, oh, this is Burgundy. Oh, this is, you know, Northern Germany or anything like that. You can tell this is from California, um, but in such a amazing, fantastic, great way. Like this, this is like paying the best homage to California Pinot out there. Um, you get those bright, plump, juicy flavors that you get with the Pinot, um, especially from this area, but it's still lean in style. It has this in extremely elegant amount of neutral oak to it. Um, 14 months is how long they're aging this for, so it's a good period of time for sure. Um, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful wine. Sorry, that was me texting. Okay. I'm, like, I'm like, like, I did a stupid happy dance when I had this the first time. Yeah, and that's and that's your vintages too. So if you guys are wondering about vintages, right? So we are drinking the um, the 18 Pinot. We're aging for 14 months, right? Uh, but the 19 uh, uh, Rosé because we only age for five months, therefore being released early. So that's why the vintage. These are all current vintages that you guys are drinking, uh, but. Uh, that's it's all just about aging and when they release them so the 17 that i'm committing to in front of all of these people and you are as well that you're going to get me some of i have witnesses um is the same it's from the it's the 70 well i don't know what the percentage is but it's the the um the mix of the sanford and benedict is it like the same style as the 18 or I, you know, I haven't tasted it in a long time. I'll have to revisit. Um, and they may have sourced from not quite the same sourcing, but I'll definitely look into that. I mean, it's, it's still got the exact same points from Venice. Um, okay. It just might be a little bit different in style, but okay. I'll just have to bring you a bottle by and we'll have to do a little taste just as soon as I get it oh, and uh, we'll revisit. That's not illegal. <laughs> um, I was about to start writing when you looked over and I was like, oh, that was me writing you. Um, this Pinot is the reason why, not this in particular, but this kind of Pinot is the reason why I am into wine. Like when something makes you dance like a stupid fool, when you drink, and you've seen my stupid dance, Tracy, where I'm like, ooh, anyway, I'm not gonna do it right now. Um, like something that literally from one side of the bar where you just like stop and you're like, holy shit. What am I drinking right now? It just, especially right now when there's so much to not, to focus on negatively, like there's just, when something's that special, it like envelops you like, like a pillow or like a dog cuddling you at night. Like it's just so great and fun and yummy. And you don't even need to know the why it tastes so great. You just appreciate the fact and you stop. And you have a little moment just with the wine. That Pinot did that for me. So I'm, again, I'm so mad at myself that I sold it all. Oh. <laughs> I know, I know. I, pro I promise we'll get you more, Sandy. They still have the Sanford and Benedict, which I know is more expensive, but, um, and we'll get you some Domaine de la Cote somehow, some way, we'll get you that. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stick to the 17 here pretty soon. But I'm uh, glad that you guys are able to enjoy it. It's not like I haven't had it before. <laughs> but now that we're tasting through it again, and I'm reminded how amazing it is, like, I just hope and I get it too. Like, I just, it's so special. I don't think I can stress enough, like, these guys, are rock star winemakers. I mean, they are one of the most well-known dynamic winemaker duos in all of California today. They are all over every wine, California, anything. Those guys are there. I mean, they're just, they're incredible. And every year they get bigger and bigger. And I'm like, you know what? Their next wine, it's not going to be so good. Like the fame's going to go to their head. The quality is going to go down. It's going to suck. And every year I taste their wine and I'm like, damn, this is God, <laughs> um, but they're they're just incredible, incredible winemakers, um, and they they just really know what they're doing, and it's it's fun to drink a product of it's a you know it's a it's like I said it's a labor of love drinking something that somebody cares so much about. In the three years I've been with Natural, you guys, uh, when I first started with Natural, I would go to my accounts and I'd say I have Sandy, and all of my buyers were like, who? And now. I can't even get enough into the state 
And that's in a matter of three years that that's how big these guys have gotten in, in popularity, not in size. Um, so it's just really special. I'm glad you guys are able to try Sandy now because mark my words, in the next three to five years, your friends will be like, oh my God, you guys, you've tried Sandy. I've never been able to get any because they don't make enough and it's so expensive and blah, 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 blah. Like that's what happens with people like this. Um, so you're lucky I'll that you were able to try Sandy. Right? <laughs> yeah. And when you get in on the ground level, like Jen, uh, you always get the goods. So it's, it's, I've seen it happen in my, my little three years in my company with so many of our producers that we have of stuff that I used to be like, couldn't sell. And now it comes in, it drops and people like I, I sell it out in three days. I mean, it's, it happens a lot. Um, and thank God there's a huge, huge um, excitement and buzz around natural wine right now, finally. Um, and I'm so excited about it because it's just, it's just, I love it. And it's, it's my heart. Um, but uh, I do want to get over to what Amber said about it smells like cigarettes. And I totally, uh, understand what you're saying there, Amber. A lot of people would say cigar smoke. Um, and that is very, very true. Um, it's just sometimes what a Pinot can, can smell like and can be like with the terroir, but it's not off-putting, right? It's not like you're like, ew, it's an ashtray. Like it's, it just kind of gives it a little bit of this, like, masculine edge I feel like I'm kind of like sitting in a in a cigar room with the guys and having a steak dinner sometimes with that um, but if that that aroma can be really really pungent um, in in uh, in pinots that are really high in alcohol um, so if you get a ton of cigar on the nose it may may be um, it can kind of indicate how strong or how much alcohol there there is in the Pinot Noir, but definitely a big indicator of, of Pinot uh, from this area for sure. <laughs> 